Man, it's so good to be with you. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Genesis chapter 29. While you're turning there, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to my mom and then my wife. They, they are not here with me. They are in Wheaton. So the only way that I was able to preach on Mother's Day is I promised Miss Joni that I, I would get home as soon as possible. But I love my wife and she is my best friend and she is one of the best moms I've ever seen in the entire world. <laughs> next to my mom, of course, next to my mom, of course. But, but I also know uh, Mother's Day is definitely um, a day that we celebrate moms, but I also understand that it's a heavy day for many of you. Maybe this is your first Mother's Day without your mom and it's just a painful day. Uh, maybe it's a painful day because maybe you didn't know your mom or your mom may in your, in, in your mind wasn't the best. And, and I get it. And so know that you are loved. And as we will see this morning, God can meet you in your mess. So I need some help this morning. You ready to help me this morning? All right, so uh, I need you to say amen to these statements if, if they reflect something that you've said before. All right, here, here it is, no, number one. Have you ever said, now again, if you have said this or something like this, just say amen. And, and then if you're engaging with us online, you can just type amen in the chat. Life is messy. Have you ever told anybody, you're just a mess? Amen. And then have you ever said, I'm just a hot mess? Amen. I heard a lot of women there. Um, <laughs> like, men, I, I don't know if we say that or not. Maybe we say, man, we're so jacked up. I, I, I don't know what, but, but I know that my wife has said that many, many times. I'm just a hot mess. L let me just say, like, we, we don't start out in life knowing or wanting life to be messy. Uh, we, we don't kind of get to the point in our life, hey, we just wanna be a mess. Uh, we, we don't wanna get to the point where we're just telling someone else, hey, man, you're just a hot mess. You're just, we, we don't get to that point. Like, when I, when I think about this idea of mess, a couple images come to my mind. Uh, first of all, I, I think of a clean desk because this is the kind of desk that I want. I want a clean desk. Now, now typically this happens on Monday, but by Friday, my desk looks like this. Just becomes messy. Life happens, things happen, and it becomes a mess. Uh, I also think about a, a like a toolbox. Any any tool guys out there, like Tim the Toolman Taylor type type guys. Like, uh, is this your tool 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 uh, area? Because uh, I'm not a tool guy at all. Here's what my tool area looks like. My my tool area looks like this. I have, I mean, I really am not a, a tool person at all. Uh, Joni is far more inclined to know what she's going after than, than I am. Like, she'll send me down in the basement, hey, babe, go get me a screwdriver. And I'm like, okay. And then she'll say, get me a flathead. And I'm like, what's a flathead? And, but she knows, she knows. But that's what our toolbox looks like. Also, I think about, I think about hair. Like, uh, I, I, I love good hair. And like, I love making sure my hair is right where I want it. That's why I put a lot of product in my hair. I put a lot of hairspray in my hair. And so, so women, I, I kind of understand. I understand the whole thing where it takes a long time to get ready in the morning because you want your hair to be just right. And if you have one of those, you ever had one of those little hairs that you just, you cannot, tame and you finally tame me, you're like, yes, I have arrived. Well, I, I have those sometimes. And then my oldest, Caleb, he, he, he wants to mess with me because he knows how much I like my hair in place, clean, tidy, neat. And so he'll come and he'll mess up my hair and I'll feel like my hair is this. I'm like, man, bro, man, come on. Like I want to ground him. <laughs> so, and, and then I also think about family pictures. Like our family pictures are really nice and neat and pleasant. But this is really what our families look like, isn't it? Our families look like a total disaster. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> That's your life. <laughs> you know, when I, think about, when I think about messy, I think about uh, its definition. Unpleasant, untidy, lacking in order, chaotic, things are out of place. You, you see, we don't begin life like that. We want life to be nice and neat and pleasant and together and orderly. That, that's what we want life to be. But we all know, you and I, we, we, we all know 
that life gets messy, life gets difficult, life gets chaotic, life gets unpleasant. And so here's my question is, how do you process the messes in your life? Because again, we're, we're talking about changes that happen and when changes happen, we enter into a time of transition. So when messes happen, how do we enter into those transitions? How do we process the mess on our hands? Are, are, are you ready to know how you do that? All right, here we go. Let me go ahead and give it to you. Here's the main point. To process the mess on our hands, we must get to the point where the Lord is the master of our heart. Mess happens. So how do you, how do you process that? Well, you got to get to the point. You got to get to the point where the Lord is the master of your heart. Now, to unpack this point, we're going to look and a woman's story by the name of Leah. Everybody say Leah. Leah. Now to understand her story of what we see in Genesis 29, we, we, we gotta go backwards and we gotta kind of understand the family that she marries into because she's going to marry a, name by, marry a man by the name of Jacob. So to understand Leah, we gotta give you the backstory of Jacob. Now Jacob was a twin, not an identical twin, but he had a twin named Esau and his parents were Isaac and Rebekah. Now, if you remember your Old Testament, Abraham and Sarah had Isaac. Isaac, his name means he laughs. And so because Abraham and Sarah, they were very old when they had Isaac. That's why when God showed up to Sarah and says, you're gonna have a baby this time next year, she laughs, ha, 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 I'm so old. And God's like, I got your laugh. And a year later, she had Isaac. Now, Isaac and Rebecca, they have Esau and Jacob. Now, Esau comes out first and he is red and hairy, which is why they named him Esau. Esau's name means red and hairy. How would you like your mom and dad to name you Ewok? Like you just hairy, you, cut, you, cut, you, you came out that way. That, that is a weird name. Now Esau, he, he grows up to be like one of the Duck Dynasty brothers. He was a man's man. He wore Wrangler jeans. He had a big, huge belt buckle. He drove a Dodge Ram super cab. He collected guns. He was a hunter. He, he, he dabbled in taxidermy. Like, I mean, he is a man. He, when you shake his hand, he almost breaks it. He's that kind of man. He's tough. Now, Jacob, on the other hand, he's not like Esau. He, he's the polar opposite. But when but when Jacob's coming out of the womb, his little hand is grabbing at his brother's heel, which is why they named him Jacob, which means heel grabber, means trickster, deceiver. How would you like to be named basically liar? So on one hand, you got Chewbacca, Ewok, and then on the other hand, you got liar, deceiver, manipulator. What a great family we have here. <laughs> now, Jacob, he was a mama's boy. And he would be what many refer today as metrosexual. You're like, what is a metrosexual? I'm, I'm glad that you asked. He was a man who went to get manis and petties. So he went with his mama to get manis and petties. Uh, he wore designer clothing and he went to a stylist, not a barber. He drove a Prius hybrid because he cared about the environment. He was scared of snakes and alligators. Some of you got that, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, I was swimming this past week. In a pool, in a pool, not, not in a lake, in a pool, in somebody's pool in their backyard. As I'm swimming laps, I stop to turn and go the other way. As I stop to turn, there's this little baby snake swimming next to my head. No, thank you. He can have the pool. I'll get out. So <laughs> definitely do not like snakes or alligators. <laughs> Welcome to Florida is what people told me. <laughs> now, let me say something about Jacob's name. So the fact that he is a heel grabber a manipulator, a deceiver, that would define him for most of his life. He was constantly grabbing at something to get ahead. He was constantly uh, grappling and, and striving for something that would satisfy him and fulfill him. You see, Jacob is a poster child for humanity. We're constantly grabbing at things. We're grabbing at finances. We're grabbing at relationships. We're grabbing at jobs. We're grabbing at families so that we might feel satisfied, so that we might be fulfilled. But he's never satisfied. He's never fulfilled. That's why he's this heel grabber. He's constantly grabbing at things, hoping that that will be the thing that fully satisfies him. 
Now, one of the things that he does in order to grab is that he manipulates his brother Esau one day for Esau to give him his birthright. Now, the thing about the birthright in this culture is that the firstborn basically inherited everything. So the family line would pass down through the firstborn. So he got all the possessions, he got the property. And so Jacob, he's, he's not the firstborn, he's the secondborn. And so he thinks that if he gets Esau's place, that he'll be satisfied, he'll be happy. So one day Esau comes into the house from hunting and the he didn't kill anything because he's extremely hungry. So he walks into the kitchen and Jacob's in there. He is putting a bowl of Campbell chicken noodle soup in the microwave. And so Esau's like, man, I'm so hungry. I don't like chicken noodle soup, but I'm starving. Jacob, give me some of your soup. And Jacob, he thinks to himself, hey, this is a good time to manipulate my brother in him giving me his birthright. So he says, all right, Esau, you're so hungry. You want my Campbell chicken noodle soup? Here's what, here's what I'll give you for this. If you give me your birthright, I'll give you a bowl of soup. And Esau, he's a little drama queen at that point. He's like, well, what good is my birthright if I'm dead? Give me the bowl of soup. And so Jacob says, ah, here's the soup. Give me your birthright. So at this point, Jacob has Esau's birthright. But to seal the deal, years later, Isaac, the dad, has to bestow the blessing of the firstborn on Jacob. But Isaac knows nothing of this deal. So one day, Esau is out hunting because this is the day that he's going to get the blessing of Isaac. Well, so while Esau is out hunting, Rebecca and Jacob, they conspire to manipulate Isaac into giving Jacob the blessing. So guess what they do? This is pretty cool. They go down to the local party city. It's not Halloween yet, but they go down to the local party city. They get a Chewbacca outfit. They put it on Jacob and Jacob then goes into the living room to his dad and presents him the meal. I mean, like you, you, think, I'm, you, you think I'm kind of uh, telling, telling a lot. No, no, here's what they did. They went out and killed a goat. They took the goat's hair and they slapped it all over Jacob so that when Isaac, because he is deaf and he's blind, he's, he's old in age. So he couldn't go get bifocals. He couldn't go get a hearing aid. So he's deaf and blind. And so they're slapping all this goat hair on him so that when he goes in there to next to Isaac and Isaac starts feeling around, he's like, okay, good, it's, 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 it's a seesaw but it's not. So that's why I say he got a Chewbacca outfit, comes in there so that he can deceive his dad in giving him the blessing. So that's why he dresses up like Esau. I could imagine that he puts uh, ax spray on him that smells like dopey. <laughs> now only hunters will get that. See, here's the thing. I, can, I, I, I actually can identify with both Esau and Jacob because I grew up in the rural South and so I grew up as a redneck. I grew up hunting, fishing, as long as my dad would take the fish off the hook. So I did all that. I know some of you are like, I'm pulling your main card, man, I'm pulling it. I, you can pull it, here you go. As long as you, long as you take off the, you know, the fish off the hook, I'm, I'm there with you. But so I grew up like an Esau, but in some sense I became like a, a, a Jacob. And so, so Jacob's going in there trying to deceive his dad and he does. And there Isaac bestows the firstborn blessing on Jacob. Now, a few hours later, Esau, he comes in from hunting, cooks his dad his favorite meal, brings it into the living room where he says, dad, I'm here to get the blessing. Here's your meal. To which Isaac says, uh, weren't you just here a couple hours ago? And Esau's like, no, 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 dad. I was out hunting and then I was preparing the meal for you. He's like, well, I've already given away the, the firstborn blessing. And undoubtedly, I gave it to your brother, Jacob. Now, let me ask you, if you're Esau, how, how do you feel right now? How are you processing that, that? How are you processing that? You're livid. So guess what Esau does? Esau swears that after Isaac dies, that he's going to go and get his Smith and Wesson Model 29, and he's coming after Jacob. He's going to kill him. He stole my blessing. He's manipulated my father. I'm going to kill him. Well, so now Rebecca... She's all beside herself because Jacob's her favorite. So that, again, that, that's one of the things I would say just on a side note is don't play favorites in your family. See, see, Isaac's favorite was Esau. Rebecca's favorite was Jacob. And they pit one another against each other. 
So, I mean, just, just, just when we look at, when we look at the families that God uses, they are dysfunctional, which should give us a little bit of calm today. So Jacob runs away and he's going to go to Rebecca's brother's house, Laban. Now, before Jacob basically flees, both Rebecca and Isaac give him instructions about who to marry and who not to marry. So, so they, they give him some instructions about what kind of woman he should be looking for. Now, Jacob heads east towards Laban's house. Now, let me go ahead and teach you something else about the Old Testament. Anytime people are moving east, that is not a good sign. That is, that is actually away from the Lord. See, when Adam and Eve, when they were kicked out of the garden, guess which direction they headed? East. When God calls Abraham to go to the land that he's going to show him, guess which direction he heads? West. See, see, Jacob, he's headed east. He is a hill grabber. He's a deceiver. He's a manipulator. He's, he's wandering in the world, trying to grab at things other than God. So now he gets to the general vicinity of Laban's property and he comes to a well. And there he meets Rachel, one of Laban's daughters. Now, just keep in mind, Rachel now is his first cousin. Now, I could imagine that Jacob, he is at the well, taking the instructions that his mom and dad have given him. And so now he's putting on his player hat. He's gonna be very flirtatious. So I, I imagine it's kind of the Joey Tribbiani friends deal where he's like, how you doing? <laughs> maybe, he had some, maybe he had some pickup lines. He's like, I'm new in town. Can I get directions to your heart? <laughs> That's cheesy, sorry. <laughs> Maybe he said something like, uh, are, you, are you religious? Because you, you have to be an answer to my prayers. <laughs> I know. Don't. So Rachel takes Jacob back home to Laban. And Laban gets to, you know, gets to know Jacob. They, they catch up and he tells Jacob, like, I don't expect you to work for free while you're here with me. So what do you want in exchange for your work? And here's Jacob's reply. I want Rachel and I'll work seven years in exchange for Rachel's hand in marriage. Now, mind you that the going rate for a bride price back then, the going rate was 30 to 40 shekels. A year's salary was around 18 shekels. So by Jacob saying he would work seven years for Rachel, he is saying she is worth 126 shekels. I would like to see this woman because, because commentators and theologians would say, this is insane. And people reading this were like, this is insane. Why would he pay that much for Rachel? Well, we see in verse 17 and 18, here's why. Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful and Jacob was in love with Rachel. Now, at the end of the day, I want us to be very clear. That love that he is in with Rachel wasn't really love, it was lust. And see, lust will make you do some stupid things. Just look at our culture right now. We are in such a lustful culture, we will do stupid, insane, and wreck our life type things because of lust. And that's what Jacob's doing. So he works for seven years. He counts down the very minute when seven years are up. Like he goes to Laban, he's like, it's time. And I could imagine these seven years, I bet you he has Marvin Gaye playing every day. Let's get it on. Woo. I mean, like, I, I bet he has that. You like the high note that I just hit? Yeah. You're like, how do you know this, Pastor Josh? Well, look at verse 21. I'm, 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 not do, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything that the Bible isn't telling us. Verse 21, chapter 29. After working for Rachel for seven years, Jacob says to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed. I want to make love to her. See, it wasn't about life happily ever after with Rachel. It was about getting in the sack with Rachel. So for seven years, that's all the man could think about. Let's get it on. So he's ready. 
So now Laban invites everyone to celebrate the marriage of Jacob and Rachel, but something happens on the honeymoon. Laban pulls an old switcheroo. Probably the only time this has ever happened in the history of mankind. Because as, as they have had kind of the ceremony, now Jacob is getting ready to go into his tent with Rachel, but something happens. Laban switches out Rachel and sends in Leah. Now you have to, you have to keep in mind, this is in antiquity. There, 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 there are no lights. It's, it's pitch black dark. And so Leah comes in and they have their honeymoon. It's the greatest night of Jacob's life, the greatest night of Leah's life. But then morning comes. And when morning comes, Jacob wakes up next to Leah. He had to be so plastered that night. I mean, he had, like, he, he had to be so drunk. And so after the booze wears off, he realizes that he wakes up next to Leah and he's livid. Could you imagine? That's a bad honeymoon. Like I remember, I actually have a couple of bad stories about our honeymoon, Joni and I. So we will have been married 19 years, uh, a couple months from now. And, 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 and I remember two particular things. One, it was the cigar incident. Now, see, uh, growing up, I grew up Southern Baptist. We didn't drink, we didn't smoke, and we didn't date girls who did either. So that's, that's me growing up. <laughs> that was funny anyways, but anyways. <laughs> so as I'm now, as I'm going on to my honeymoon, my father-in-law, he says, uh, hey, you're going to Cancun. You need to get a Cuban cigar. And I'm like, all right, I've never smoked a day in my life. And so we get there to Cancun. I go grab a, a cigar, go uh, purchase a cigar. And now I'm sitting on my bal- balcony. No lie. We're just hanging out, enjoying our honeymoon. I'm sitting on the balcony. I'm reading the Bible. I'm being very spiritual as I smoke this cigar. All right, so I'm reading the Bible, looking out over the ocean, and I'm just, I'm just having a great time with the Lord. Well, undoubtedly, I, I didn't smoke the cigar right because I inhaled and I became extremely sick. And that night we had a beautiful, a beautiful romantic dinner all planned. Luckily for me, I had married a nurse. She nursed me back to health. Well, a couple of days later, so that was, a bad, that was, that was bad. A couple of days later, we uh, do a sea do excursion. And so Joni's like, hey, you can drive since you, you're so used to sea dues because you grew up on, on a lake. And so I'm like, good, I want to be in control anyways because that kind of man I am, I want to be in control. So <laughs> that, that's not the kind of man I want to be. <laughs> so, so I get on the sea dew, she's on behind me. And then Dally, we got the worst sea dew that they were giving out that day because instead of riding the waves, it would go under the waves. See, sea dudes aren't supposed to, they are not supposed to go under the waves, they're supposed to go over the waves. Well, every time we hit a wave, we go into the wave. And my wife is yelling at me, what are you doing? You don't know how to drive. And I'm like, yes, I do, woman, I know. This is a bad sea dew. She's like, and we are arguing. This is our first argument as married couple. We almost got divorced. On a sea do. She thought I was doing it on purpose. Like, see, like those are some bad honeymoon stories. This is a bad honeymoon story. So Jacob is livid. He confronts Laban and says, Why did you Jacob me? That's literally what the Hebrew says. Why did you deceive me? Why'd you manipulate? Why'd you Jacob me? And here's what Laban says He says, Well, it's not customary for the younger to get married before the older. See, Jacob, what you did to Esau, it's not customary. See, Jacob was faced with himself. Jacob had just got Jacobed. Do you know that if you really think about our culture, many a times they get mad over someone Jacobing them. And the thing is, they've done the very same thing. Like that actually goes, that actually is a really great story politically for us as a nation. You got one political party upset at the other because you did this. And then when they get in power, they look back, well, you did this. And it's all about Jacobing one another. So now Jacob still wants Rachel. He's smitten. He's obsessed with Rachel. He thinks Rachel is the trophy wife of all trophy wives. He wants to be with Rachel. So here's what Laban says. Well, work for me another seven years and I'll give you Rachel. And Jacob says, all right. 
as long as you give her to me right now. And so that's exactly what happens. Laban gives Jacob a Rachel. They get married right then and there. And then he works another seven years. So think about it this way. When all is said and done, he would have spent 252 shekels for a woman that was supposed to only cost him 40 shekels. (laughs) And then we read in verse 30 in chapter 29. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. Wow, we have a dysfunctional family, don't we? Could you imagine Leah? Imagine, what is she going through? Rachel Rachel is pulled by Laban only to send her in. She has an incredible night. Because, because, here's the thing about Leah, what you'll read is that she had weak eyes, but Rachel, but Rachel was lovely in figure and in beauty. Basically what it was is that Leah was the ugly sister, Rachel was the beautiful one. So all of her life she had been, been shown no attention. She was always the ugly duckling. But, but now, now she's caught in this kind of weird love triangle where Jacob just doubt, doubts on, on, on dotes on, on Rachel, smitten and obsessed with her and doesn't really pay any attention to Leah. How, how do you process that? If you're Leah, how do you process that? It's a mess. The perfect sister has won again. And now Leah is hurt and disappointed, lonely, isolated. And what we see in verses 31 through 34 is how Leah processes her mess. So look at, let's look at the four ways real quick how Leah processes this mess. Number one, here's how she processes it. God may not save me from this mess, but he will meet me there in my mess. Verse 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant, gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. Leah does not feel loved. God sees that Leah is not loved, but God loved her. So don't don't miss this. When you don't feel loved, when you feel like life is a mess, I want you to know that we serve a God who will meet you in your mess and he will love you in your mess. And that's the reason why she names the son Reuben. It is because the Lord has seen my misery. The Lord sees your misery. And he'll meet you there. He'll meet you in the stress of your parenting, in the messiness of a busy life, in a messy divorce, in being empty nesters when you're trying to refigure who you are. He'll meet you in the sexual addiction and pornography. He'll meet you in the mental illness where you are dealing with stress and anxiety and depression when you feel like a mess. He'll meet you in the complicated family dynamics. He will meet you in the job changes and the changes that it has brought about to your marriage and family. He'll meet you in the financial mess. He'll meet you in the death of a loved one when you are just overwhelmed by your grief. God will meet you in your mess and he will love you in your mess. But the second thing that we see here is how Leah is processing her mess is that sometimes trying to clean up my own mess just makes it messier. So she has Reuben hoping that surely my husband will love me now. Then verse 33, she conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. You see what Leah's doing, don't you? She wants to be loved and accepted by Jacob. And then what she does to be loved and accepted is to go to work performing with what she thinks will make Jacob love her. That's why Reuben means see a son, Jacob. Now you'll love me. Simeon means heard, hoping that Jacob will notice and attach himself to her. Levi, which means attach, looking for Jacob to notice her. 
In other words, she imagined that if she could be more perfect, if she could work hard enough, if she could just perform right, she would be loved. If she could just do the right thing for her husband, her husband would love her. I saw this movie this past week called Everywhere Everywhere All at Once. And it's a weird, weird movie about the metaverse. And Dally, that's what movies are about these days, the metaverse. Well, the main character, she is unhappy in her life, in this reality. And somehow she connects herself to all of these various realities uh, of her life. But what these versions of reality are all about are decisions that she had in her past and she, sh- and she chose a different option. And so this version of reality was about her choosing this pathway. This version of reality was about her choosing this pathway. So on one pathway, she, she, she chose a, a sexuality pathway for her to go down. On this, she chose fame and fortune to go down. On this pathway, she chose a traditional family pathway to go down. But the whole movie was about how unsatisfied she was was, how unfulfilled she was, how unhappy she was. So in every version of her realities, she was unhappy and life was a mess. And it definitely represents our culture. Like you could go back, you could go back 10 years, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And you're like, man, I wish I would have made this decision. What she is saying, what our culture even knows is that you can go back and you can make different decisions, but you will still end up a mess and unhappy and dissatisfied. Now here's the problem I have with the movie. I have two problems. One, one of the versions of reality had hot dog fingers. It's weird and nasty and they should, they should edit it out. <laughs> it's awful. But the second problem I have with it is that the main character of the story who was unhappy actually in some sense finds her own happiness. But at the end of the day, I I want us to realize this, you cannot, I cannot, we cannot, the world cannot clean up its own mess. All it does, it makes life messier. That's what we see with Leah. She's trying to work, work out her mess to where it's clean and tidy, but she can't do it. She just ends up more a mess. You see, we are all tempted today to chase happiness and satisfaction in all the wrong places. We're tempted to clean up our mess on our own. That is the reason why some obsess over their bodies and almost kill themselves trying to obtain the perfect physique. Some spend money so that they, so that they can uh, have the right clothes and the right product so that people will see them. Some dress in such a way, particularly girls and, and, and women, dress in such a way to get attention and attraction, ending up really attracting the wrong kind of person. Some get involved in sex actually inappropriate and dishonoring relationships in order to feel loved and not be so lonely and end up feeling used. Uh, Some are constantly seeking likes and hearts on social media to feed this never satisfied monster of attention. Some people are looking for a spouse to come in and save them from their previous marriage. Some people are looking for a person with lots of money, a sugar daddy. Uh, Maybe it's education, grades, getting into the right college, landing the perfect job and salary. And so boys and girls, men and women, put godlike expectations on themselves to earn something they believe will fully satisfy them. Maybe it's sports, playing division one, reaching the big leagues. And so girls and boys, men and women, put godlike expectations on a ball or a coach or a team to fulfill what they perceive is their ultimate need and desire. And all they're doing is looking for love in all the wrong places. Which reminds me of that song. Well, I spent a lifetime looking for you. Single bars and good time lovers were never true. Playing a fool's game, hoping to win and telling those sweet lies and losing again. I was looking for love. Looking for love. Oh, you missed it. It's too many faces, too many faces. And then it goes on. And I was alone then, no love in sight. And I did everything I could get to get me through the night. Don't know where it started, where it might end. I turned to a stranger just like a friend because I was looking for love in all of the wrong places, looking for love in too many faces. Hey, hey, come in here for this church. When you or I work for or try and per- perfect ourselves to earn the love or to, re- to, to receive the love of something or someone, we are setting ourselves up for ultimate and royal disappointment for a messier life. You know why? Because if we feel like we have to earn someone's love, if we feel like we have to earn satisfaction, then that means we are setting ourselves up for a never ending race of feeling satisfied. 
That's why many times we get married because we have worked really good in the courting phase only to get married. And when life happens, a lot of those things fall apart. And then you wake up and you feel like you're married to the wrong person because they're not doing what they did when you courted them. And then also, Anything you set your ultimate affection and love on that is vulnerable to you changing for the worst, them changing for the worst, or it changing for the worst is setting yourself up for ultimate disappointment, hurt, and heartache, which will leave you emotionally and personally in a mess. We are ascribing godlike expectations on human beings and material things. And that's exactly what Leah is doing. She is going to work trying to clean up her own mess, but it's just making her life messier. How do you know that? Well, you remember every transition is transformational. Every transition is what? And so you have two choices. You can either be transformed into the image of Adam. You can be transformed into the image of Jesus. How do you think she's being transformed by going to work, trying to clean up her own mess into the image of Adam? She's probably more hurt, more jaded, cynical of men, probably resentful to Rachel, bitter towards Jacob, angry at her dad, and it is tearing her up emotionally. Could you imagine being Leah? And every night you're going to bed and you hear Rachel and Jacob next door. Could you imagine you wake up the next day and Jacob and Rachel, they're holding hands and they're walking by and you want that you want that and you can't get it and so that that transition in your life the way you are processing it it is hurting you it's damaging you it is transforming you into the worst version of yourself but then but then the third thing comes of how she processes it and here's the third way I might have to live with my messes, but God will calm and comfort me in my mess. Verse 35, she conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah, then she stopped having children. She gets to the point where she says, I'm tired of working, I will turn to praise. I'm tired of putting my hope in Jacob. I'll put my hope in God. I'm tired of trying to get the attention of of a man. I'll turn my attention to God. I'm tired of being alone and isolated. I'll, I'll turn and praise my heavenly father. I'm tired of being disappointed by a God who doesn't show up. I'll turn to the one who's never missed an appointment. I'm tired of pursuing this guy who hasn't shown me any interest. I'll turn to the one who has never ceased his pursuit of me. And what commentators say is that by naming him Judah and then getting to the point where it says, then she stopped having children, she rested. Now don't miss this, nothing changed physically. Nothing changed relationally in Leah's life. Her life was still a mess, Jacob was still a loser, and Rachel was still the mean pretty girl but her attention changed and her heart changed. She turned to the Lord and the Lord comforted her heart. You see church, we have to get to the point in those messy transitions like Leah, that the master can and will calm and comfort our hearts. Even in our financial mess, even when we are on the brink and rink of bankruptcy, God will bring us calmness and comfort. Even in the vocational mess, when we have been terminated or you're looking for another job, a better job, God can bring you comfort and calmness. Even in a messy divorce, in a messy court case, God can bring comfort and calmness. Even when you are in emotional mess where you are processing great loss, God can bring you comfort and calmness. And why is that? Because your ultimate satisfaction and security, fulfillment and comfort in life It isn't a spouse, but your cosmic groom. It isn't your children or having children, but that the fact that you are the child of the most high God. It isn't your good works, but it's his greater work on the cross. It isn't a job or a career, but becoming part of the master craftsman's good work. It isn't finances or your purchasing power, but knowing that you were bought with a price that wasn't your own. It isn't your lifestyle, but hiding your life in Jesus. It isn't your talent 
balance on what you're able to do, but on the fact that you are his treasured possession. It isn't your beauty, but it's in the fact that you've been made in the image of the beloved. It isn't your health, but that your name, your name is written in the book of life. And one day you will be part of his new creation where there will be no more disease, no more sickness, no more mourning, no more death, no more crime for the former things have passed away. Behold, he has made all things new. If they come in here for this one, you'll never be faced by your mess when you have put your faith in the master. Why? Why? Because the Lord will be enough. 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 And the Lord will be enough. You'll never be phased by mess. Yeah, hey, life is messy. Life happens. But you'll never be phased. I will never be phased. Hey, Northland, we are we serve a God that is not phased by the mess of churches. Which leads me to number four. Oh, I get excited about number four. Here it is. Number four, and I'm done. Ooh, this is good. God can take my mess and work out his best. His best is a masterpiece. Okay, um, guess who Judah becomes? You see, see, the author writing the story actually knows who will come from the line of Judah. Guess who? The lion of Judah. See, Genesis 49, Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you, you have gone up. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. You, you see, the author, the author knew that one day, one day from, from the line, from the line of Leah, sometime after, after uh, uh, Reuben and after Judah, what will come, what will come from the line of Judah is Jesus, the cosmic king, the Messiah who has come to make all things new so Leah her life might be a mess just but wait wait Leah there's a masterpiece coming hey there might be a mess in your life right now but let me just say a masterpiece is coming even in your mess God is working out his best so that's why we're about to observe communion so if if you don't have a cup just go ahead and slip up your hand and and the usher will come and will give you this communion cup. Now, here's the thing that I love about communion, particularly in this message, is, is this, this cup represents the body of Jesus that was battered and bruised. It represents the blood that was shed. And I, 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 church, I want us to kind of, in some sense, transport ourselves back to that day when Jesus was battered and bruised, when they would punch him in the face, when they would take a cat of nine tails and they would, they would hit him in the back. I want you to think about how messy it was. And then they would take the six inch spikes and they would drive those spikes through his hands and through his feet. Think about how messy, how painful, how untidy, how unpleasant that was. What is that? That's Jesus descending into our mess. See, 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 the cross tells us that Jesus descended into our mess. And so as we take these elements, we are remembering that Jesus met us in our mess, that we cannot work our way out of the mess, but that he will come and comfort us in our mess, but it's in our mess, in his mess, and identifying with our mess that he is raising us into a masterpiece. So let's go ahead and tear the first film off. When Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples, they're, they're kind of lounging around, just kind of like this. They didn't have seats like we have. They're just kind of lounging. And he takes a piece of bread, he breaks it, then he hands it to his, all of his disciples, and he says, take, eat, this is my body. Then you can tear the next second layer of film off. And 
And so as he is uh, sitting there at the table with the disciples, he takes the cup. He says, this is the blood of the new covenant that will be poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I want to read to you from the storybook Bible about Leah. Here's what the storybook Bible says. No one loves me, Leah said. I'm too ugly. But God didn't think she was ugly. And when he saw that Leah was not loved and no one wanted her, God chose her to love her specially, to give her a very important job. One day God was going to rescue the whole world through Leah's family. Now when Leah knew that God loved her in her heart, Suddenly it didn't matter anymore whether her husband loved her the best or if she was the prettiest. Someone had chosen her. Someone did love her with the never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. So when, uh, when Leah had a baby boy, she named him Judah, which means this time I will praise the Lord. And that's just what she did. And you'll, you'll never guess what what job, gave, what job God gave Leah. You see, when God looked at Leah, he saw a princess. And sure enough, that's exactly what she became. One of Leah's children's, children's children would be a prince, the prince of heaven, God's son. The prince would love God's people. They wouldn't need to be beautiful for him, for him to love them. He would love them with all of his heart and they would be beautiful because he loved them. Just like Leah. When you have a mess on your hands, you will need to get to the point where the Lord is master of your heart.